thank you for reading, first of all. And then let's get right to the title. And I want to get one obvious question out of the way. Mm -hmm. The title is, as you know, We Need New Names. And, wow. um, and, and in this book, names are, I mean, even in the passages you read, names mm -hmm. are important in very obvious way. Names of places, ironies, names of people. Mm -hmm. The author name is an interesting case because it's not your birth name, it's a pen name. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide or what were the factors be behind picking a new name to be a writer versus who you were before you were a writer? <laughs> um, I decided being a writer was cool and I needed a cool name to, to complement cool. that identity. But seriously, um, I, I, I grew up with so, so many names. For example, my given name, Elizabeth, is the name that I discovered when I started going to school, first grade, along with my friends. We got to school So you didn't know that was your name before? Uh, it wasn't used. At home, I was called Mka. I won't finish. It's short for something, but I won't finish it. I won't <laughs> tell you the whole story. <laughs> but we went to school and discovered these names that were in our birth certificates, you know? And some of us were quite surprised to find out, oh, I'm, I'm Elizabeth, I'm this, I'm this. And uh, in the playground, our friends also called us different names, so that the whole idea of names was always fluid. Um, when it came to know Violet, Violet is my mother's name. Uh, she passed away when I was 18 months, and she wasn't really spoken about when I was growing up. I know, I mean, I knew from people talking that she had passed when I was a baby, basically. But I, I really felt this disconnect. I, I, I guess I wanted to give myself, when I became old enough, a name that honored her memory, that said she had lived. And I guess it also resolved some personal issues that I had. And uh, the N-O in my language, I know in English it's no, it's negation. So right. <laughs> when people end up knowing the story better than the person who owns the story, explain it, think the N-O means no violet. But the N-O in my language means with. So the name goes with violet, with mm. my mother. Bulawayo is the city of my people. It's, it's my hometown. And I, I lived in the U.S. for 13 years before I was able to go back home. And, you know, it's, it's a long time for a young person to be disconnected. And I guess I was nostalgic, I was homesick. I wanted a name that spoke of my homeland, that gave me that, that connection. And then going back to the issue of names in the book, I must say I come from a, a place of colorful names, names like God knows are, are really there. Mm -hmm. Darling, my best friend was called uh, Darling. Um, the, the, one of my sisters, I think there's two girls between us, her name means there are enough girls, I guess. <laughs> my, my father Thanks wasn't sir. blessed with boys until I came along, so I, I guess it was his prayer for, for, for girl children. Um, and then We Need New Names, the title wasn't quite tied to that, but I was trying to speak to the need of, of new ways of imagining our identities, new ways of seeing the world and, and seeing our, our future. It's interesting because in the book, it's not just names that you've just described how names can kind of either betray you or you can reinvent them in ways that work for you. Mm -hmm. um, but in the book, it's language in general. I mean, it's a lot of things, actually. Because the book is told by a, a child, there's a lot of things that adults take for granted as received wisdom that are opened up over the course of the book. There's uh, history, politics, family, maps, all these things that a child looks at and thinks, I don't really know why those things are the way that people say they are. It mm -hmm. doesn't really make sense. Language is interesting. In, in the passage you read, it's very, very clear in that passage how language isn't doing the thing it's supposed to do for her aunt. Uh, and there's another tactic that I noticed that's really, uh, I liked a lot, which is this sort of double word. I think there's a what, what in here, but you talked about, she'll say, it was a question, but not a question question or it was a country, but not a country country. And it's a way of, of suggesting that words on their own don't really do the thing they're supposed to do. So you need this second word to sort of fix it and clarify and make it mean the thing it's supposed to mean. As a writer, in the passage you read, the fact that language isn't doing what it's supposed to is very 
frustrating, I assume, for a writer and very painful. Is there a way in which it's liberating also that these, these words not... I mean, that double word is a nice trick because it does prove to us that the words we take for granted often don't do anything close to what we think they're doing. Um, did you, is that a real thing, first of all, the double word? Um, I think it's a real thing in, in my imagination and in how... <laughs> That's pretty real. So that, that makes it legitimate. You got a book out of it. Yeah, yeah. But, but I was always, I was trying to get to this idea that um, sometimes language fails us, especially when we, we cross borders. Mm -hmm. Uh, because sometimes it's, it's intimately tied to specific spaces, specific uh, geographic spaces, so that when, when Darling and her aunt come here, they sort of have to understand this, this new system. And for them, just like for me as, as, as an artist, it, it becomes a matter of two language systems constantly at war. Right, with the, with the outside language system from their homeland, um, sort of questioning the, the, the meaningfulness and uh, the validity and the effectiveness of this new language that they have to deal with it, and going on to help it out so that these people can claim a space in this uh, universe of, of, of expressing themselves. What's really interesting about the structure of the book is there's, there's a passage in the middle when she's coming from Zimbabwe to, um, it's, it's about how all the people left to come here. Mm -hmm. So it sort of separates the book into two halves, which is the, as you say, there's the American section in the second half and then the African section in the first half. What, in, in the interesting process is that a lot of the difficulties that Darling has in adjusting in the second half are things the readers already experience, trying to make sense of a culture that's not familiar to us, and there's one so sign that I want to read. It'll only take about 30 seconds, and then I want to ask you a question about it. So this is a sign at one point that's posted, and it says, Vodloza, bestest healer in all of this paradise and beyond, will proper fix all these problems, some things that you may encounter in your life. Bewitchedness, curses, bad luck, whoring spouses, childrenlessness, poverty, joblessness, AIDS, madness, small penises, epilepsy, bad mm -hmm. dreams, bad marriage, marriagelessness, competition at work, dead people terrorizing you. Bad luck with getting visas, especially to USA and Britain. Nonsensical people in your life. Things disappearing in your house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Please payment in Forex only. So wh when I read that, first of all, it's a great piece of writing just as a kind of concrete poem and all the oddness of it and all the weird suffixes. Is it a real sign, first of all, or are portions of it real? And is part of the, the, the book to duplicate the weird uses of language there? It's not just the strangeness of English here. So is it real? Is that partly a real sign? No, uh, it's not a real sign. I, I pride myself in trying to make my own things. <laughs> so you did not but, take uh, any portion of that sign from a posted sign? <laughs> uh, it was inspired by, by real signs where, you know, things like grammar are tossed away for meaning that makes sense within the, the context of the space. I remember you know, during my student days at Cornell, I was riding a bus from Chinatown to DC, and there was something grammatically wrong with the sign, and I took a picture and, uh, you know, forwarded it to, to friends and, and family because I just thought it was hilarious that the sign was wrong. And, you know, I was so naive to think that nobody knew the sign was wrong. <laughs> and then a while later, um, I, I read somewhere online where somebody posted a similar sign, and the guy who made the sign said, well, you think we don't know that the sign is wrong, but this is what people want to hear, or something like that. So I, 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 in a similar way, um, that sign may not make sense when you're reading it, but then it, it still gets, I think it still gets uh, to, to, to the point. And it, it was also my way, my way of kind of celebrating that, you know, the language uh, in that sign. And I'm also fascinated by non-native speakers have given themselves the, lang uh, the license to commit all sorts, all forms of violence on the English language. Yeah. Uh, I, I just find that fascinating. 
And that's how new things, I mean, it's how invention happens as well. And, and mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing reading that is that, as you say, it's totally clear what's happening. And there's habits. It's its own little text. It's, it's its own little world there. And you start to see the rhythms and the habits in that. The, the other thing that happens a lot is, uh, as, just as language is untrustworthy or potentially untrustworthy, so are maps and, and places. Mm -hmm. And this is obviously a big issue because there's a border crossing, as you say. But there's all kinds of ways in which places are constituted completely artificially. I mean, <laughs> this happens for American states, it happens for Michigan, which is sort of improperly understood initially. Like, she doesn't exactly know where she's going, because why would she? Mm -hmm. And then when she comes to America, there's a scene where she meets this guy, I'm going to forget his name, Jim, John, and he, he sort of makes, it's something like Jim or John, and he makes Africa into this weird monolith where he keeps talking about Africa, and she says, he's talking about it like it's just one place. It's 50-something countries. Mm -hmm. and, and she says something interesting, which is, I thought about telling him to leave Africa out of it. And, and so there's that sense, too, that places that are constituted by people for political reasons, economic reasons, are completely fake and artificial. When you came to the United States, is that very much, did that idea come with, I mean, you, you come from a continent where that's quite clear because these countries are often, just as often imposed and created for crazy historical reasons. Sometimes they're legitimate, sometimes not. In American geography, in American place names, did you approach it similarly? Um, I, I kind of approached it in the same way because I, I really didn't have a concrete sense of America and uh, its diversity, for instance. I, I just knew the word America and that I was going there. And as an 18-year-old, that was enough until I got here and actually realized that it's, it's a big monster of a country. You know, it's like there are many countries in it. I think Darling says the same thing. Um, it's fascinating, though, when you are looking at the African image in the West, that it's also not that far removed, right? That Africa is treated like, like one place, like a country. Um, and there are specific things that are easily associated with it, things like uh, poverty and, and crime and AIDS. So the, the question becomes, in this space where, in a way, peop there's so much mobility, people moving back and forth, we still insist on boxing spaces in one tiny box when, when we should know better, you know? Well, that's what I, I think it's very similar to what you said about language, right? You, they, the things can and do mean multiple things. Mm -hmm. They have to. Life is richer and more complicated, but people can't move forward unless they've sort of decided that it means one thing. Mm -hmm. and somehow that comforts them. I'm not, not sure why. Um, the, one of the other things is that uh, you, you just mentioned that people have a certain image of Africa or it has certain things associated with it. And one thing, because it's a narrator who's telling the story the whole time, there are things that happen pre-language. I mean, from the, so let's take uh, a basic human thing, appetite and hunger. So mm -hmm. the very beginning of the book, they're kids and they're out, and they talk a lot about personal hunger, just the fact of hunger. You don't go without food for a little, I mean, you go without food for a little while and you, you need food. That recurs repeatedly throughout the book. Actually, right up until the end, there's this kind of, I won't ruin the end for anybody, but there's this system of how food is delivered and distributed and the, the vehicles and the mechanisms that were, whereby food gets to people. Were you always, even as a little kid, even when you were the age of your protagonist, this kind of analytical skeptic where you would look at things and think, I know food either comes or doesn't come, but now I'm going to think a lot about how it does or doesn't get here. There are all these moments in the book that are sort of dilations, that you take these very simple processes and you're, you, your narrator, really widen them. And, and it becomes, they become almost essayistic treatments of these processes that you could have just said, oh, the truck came and dropped food off. But then there's a lot of wondering. Was that a trait that you had at an early age? I, I wish I could say that. Say you can. <laughs> the, your I, largest I, audience doesn't know. I, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think I was that analytic. I think that comes from me thinking in, in broader terms about issues that I feel we should concern ourselves with as, as citizens of the world. That said, I am always amazed by the capacity of children 
to, to look at situations and, and come up or see you know, the most amazing sites. For example, with the whole NGO food distribution thing, um, Darling and her friends are concerned with the fact that the photographers are, are taking pictures when, when they are not presentable, when mm -hmm. they are at their best. I think you know, that's something that you can easily pin to, to kids, because when they think camera, they think present, presentation and pr being presentable. Right, and there's not that, I mean, they, that's the interesting thing is that the kids are not necessarily less superficial, they're just more honest. They have moments of vanity, they have moments of cruelty. Uh, absolutely. And they're not held back for purposes of social standing. They're just, you know, yeah. they're more spontaneous, I guess. Oh, yes, and, and, and as a creator, I thought that was easier to do with children versus working with adult, uh, with adult characters. It can seem a little mm -hmm. compulsive in an adult, or frightening. Oh, yes. That's, those traits. So, the last time with Jeff Eugenides, I did a quick round to end where I asked him a bunch of very short questions with one or two word answers. So I'm going to uh, inflict the same lightning round upon you and we'll see. <laughs> you can say anytime you don't want to answer a question, you can just say pass or you can say no. Although now I know that no means with, so just say, <laughs> just say pass or you can hand am gesture I, me out. Am I allowed to, to answer in my language? Of course. You, okay. Whatever you want. I think right. you've established that language is a fluid thing, so answer in whatever language okay. you want. So. If you weren't a writer, what would you be? Dancer. All right. <laughs> what is a great book in the world that you think you'll never read? Jesus. <laughs> Pass. <you> fear? Pass. <laughs> All right. Is there a place in the world that you want to travel to uh, but have not yet, that you're determined to go to? India. India. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, in, by the time you're done writing, in let's say 50 years, what percent of your books do you think will take place at least partly in Zimbabwe? Five, maybe. Only 5% will take I think place? By the time I'm done, I'll be, yeah. yeah. You'll, be, you'll range all over. There will be some books that take place in India. I'll be trying to go to all over about. the place, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. I uh, read somewhere that when you were a child, you were a book thief. And that's a virtuous crime as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Thank you. Especially you're, if you're reading them and not hollowing them out for gun running or, or something. <laughs> but um, what would you do or what would you say to a child if you discovered that that child had stolen your book? Good job. Good job. <laughs> and then the final dreaded author question, which is what are you working on now or not working on now? I'm working on resting. On resting. Yes. And, and is there a new writing project taking shape? I read two, two different conflicting things. Mm -hmm. one, one interview said resting or something like resting, like she's enjoying the fruits of this book and all of the accolades. And then the other one said she's hard at work on a memoir. So those seemed in direct conflict. So that's, that's good. I think life, we are humans because we are filled with conflicts. So you but embrace that I was, I was, I embraced it. I was working on the memoir before names happened and, you know, just rendered my life, rendered my plans, uh, you know, just disturbed my plans. So with, with all the hecticness that have come from it, I'm just taking a break for so now. So success disrupted your memoir. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, I think being busy being disrupted busy. I can say success, you can't. But, but I, it's, it's also changed from memoir to a collection of stories. Um, oh, I did want to ask that one last thing, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So, <laughs> This is a, a novel, it's a weird thing to fit books into categories, but people say novel, and then other people say, well, it's a novel, but it's a collection of linked stories. And I think, that, I think what they mean by that, assuming they're not damning it with faint praise or something, is that each section resolves, in a way, itself. That you don't necessarily, you, it's a narrative, it's an arc throughout, but that each section, in a way, has standalone power and standalone ability. When you began, did you look forward to collecting them all, or were you thinking of them as pieces that were then later assembled? Pass. Pass. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, I was looking forward, I was thinking of the, the project as a whole, but I was also interested in making each section stand alone. Again, thinking of how kids experience life, you know, visualize their experience. It's like they go through something and it's done. Tomorrow is another day. So I was trying to to work with that. 
Yeah, it is interesting that in novels there are often callbacks, like if the themes or images will recur at the end as an author trick. And oddly, it happens less than you would think until she gets a little older. And mm -hmm. then there starts to be that kind of construction of memory and calling back earlier images. I don't know if that's, but it did really seem like how kids are intensely in that moment. They experience mm -hmm. that, they draw the meaning out of that. Then it's the next, it's the next thing for them. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so we have free floating microphones in the audience and people who will raise their hand and ask questions. All right, we have a microphone heading toward, she has to come to you so people can hear you. And if it's garbled, I'll repeat it. Okay, thank you. First of all, I just finished your novel and I really, really liked it. So thank you for sharing your gifts with us. Thank you. Appreciate that. About four-fifths through the book, there's a chapter that isn't part of the narrative. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. I think it's something that should be shared with young people who are writing and trying to write, especially those who've gone through an immigrant experience. And I was wondering what your thoughts were in putting that chapter into the novel, since it wasn't really part of the narrative, why you put it exactly where you did, and whether you got some pushback from your editors in putting that into the, the book. My editor is right there, ah, so. Ah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hi, editor. <laughs> So I am going to censor myself, <laughs> but uh, no, really, I, I, I don't look at it as, as a separate part of, of the, uh, the project. If, if, if you remember, a, there are two earlier chapters in that voice. One is called How, How They Appeared, which I read, and then there's How They Left, which speaks uh, to the movement of people from this space to all over, um, the country is not named, and then there's how they lived. So those chapters are in conversation with each other in the, 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 the whole novel. What I was thinking about there is that in as much as the book is in first person, we never experience life as individuals. It's not I, you know, it's, it's you of course, but for the most part, you are part of a collective. So I wanted darling to be understood within this background of, of, of people, you know, sometimes it's the same experience, sometimes it's different experiences. And knowing that she herself can't actually live everybody's life. So those moments when the narrative is seemingly disrupted by other voices, it's just my way of saying, this is, we, this is the we anchoring the eye that is darling. <laughs> All right, we can go to this side of the room. Oh, in the, the man in the back with the microphone. The man in the back. <coughs> Two questions, one easy one, maybe a little bit difficult. Okay. First question, what's the English for, for Bulawayo? What's the? English for Bulawayo. Okay. Second question, what do you see as the immediate future of Zimbabwe? Okay. <laughs> I will answer the first one and then I'll think about the second one at home. Um, she'll, she'll email you her, her answer in, about, in a year and a half. So the first one, Bulawayo, comes from the Ndebele word Bulala. Bulala means to kill. So when the Ndebele king in the, in, the, in the late, or in the early 1900s moved to Bulawayo, um, he, call, he called it a place of slaughter. It can also mean where one gets killed. Um, and his chiefs were kind of curious. They said, why are you, you know, why are you naming this town in this weird, with this weird name? Who is going to get killed and then according to historians, our king, King Lopemula, said, because it's me who's going to get, uh, to get killed, so that's, that's, what, that's what the name means. And then the future, it's hard to predict um, a future, especially if the players are not working toward a meaningful uh, future. In other words, I, I don't see tangible investments um, going on right now that makes me feel comfortable in saying, oh, things are going to be great. One can only hope uh, that we survive, that the country survive, and that there comes a time 
when our leaders are going to be the kind of leaders who have the right priorities in terms of where the country is going and what the citizens uh, deserve. It's unfortunate that I'm just a writer, you know, I don't make policy or change things, but I'm hoping great leaders come and take us to where we need to be. Uh, we can go back to that side of the room if somebody over there has a question. Oh, in the middle, you got somebody already? All right, excellent. Hi. Um, I hope this question makes sense. Uh, <laughs> so I, th I think so often if you're an artist um, and you're speaking from an experience that's outside the dominant paradigm, um, and especially if you're a writer and you're writing about people who are not straight, white, and born and growing up in this country, um, there's such a tendency to be othered by our culture and sort of boxed in and exoticized and written off as like just that identity and not really taken, um, not really seen. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that can, the fear of that I think can be a real killer for creativity and like a sense of your own power as an artist. And I guess I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that or just like, do you ever experience that kind of pressure sense mm -hmm. when you're writing and like, do you, I mean, does that make question make sense? It, it makes sense, it <laughs> makes sense and thank you, it's, it's a good question. And that's a nice necklace behind, <laughs> behind you, it's nice, it's a Zulu necklace, South Africa. Okay. Um, I think that is, uh, that does happen and for me, I mean, I can only speak from my own experience. When I create, I think I'm one of those people who always reminds myself that I am the center, you know, that I'm not at the margins or whatever. When I'm creating, when I'm, because I feel like I'm in charge of that narrative and whatever I'm working on and I give myself the license to make that, uh, to make that the center. I think that's the best thing a creator can do before, I mean, you have no control in terms of how things are going to be received, but that's, that's what I always try um, and fight for. I know though that once it gets out there, um, you know, things to happen and those questions become very relevant and there are people who are dealing with that, you know, on a daily basis. But I think it, it, takes, it takes engaged communities. You know, it's said that we are dealing with that in, in 2014, but I'm hoping there comes a time, especially where art is concerned. I think it, it should be this country where everybody matters and everybody is, is equal. I think that may be the start of us moving toward communities that begin to, to, to mirror that. But I can't wait for a time when artists uh, from everywhere and regardless of, of whoever they are, do not, do not have to deal with, with those problems. We'll go back to this side, to the gentleman in the sweater. Hi. Um, could you speak about how physical and emotional distance from Zimbabwe affects your writing about that place? Um, I think being away physically, especially for the first 13 years where I really couldn't go, made me so hungry for my country that I was more passionate in ways that I probably would never ever be if I had been on the ground. I mean, I had spent the first 18 years there and things that concerned me from outside were not my concerns because I took it for granted that I was there, it was my home, and I related to it in a different way. So there are little inconveniences. I mean, I'm an, an artist, sometimes I just want to play with the clay and touch things and see things and smell things. But um, sometimes distance kind of gives you perspective. I'm happy to say that when I was creating names, it was a time when social media was making places and spaces so accessible. You just got on Facebook and watched 
a video of people crossing the border to South Africa, which is literally how I, 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 I wrote how they lived. I was writing to these images that came, that were just bombarding us on Facebook, so I couldn't um, forget them. They became a, a part of me. I don't know, this is the last, the last half of the, I think there were two parts to the question. Um, and emotionally, I think emotionally, I, I, I've said somewhere, maybe in my head, that being outside is like being in a space of perpetual mourning for my, for my homeland. Um, whether mourning specific faces that I will never see, and sometimes with distance, people pass away when you are away, and they are gone, you never can replace that whether it's for sites that you only know that I can only see this picture in Zimbabwe, not in the US, whether it's for songs or whatever. Emotionally, there's something, for me at least, that's always, that's always missing. And when I go back home, it's like I suddenly become complete very, very quickly. And it's amazing how I had that feeling when I went back for the first time in 13 years. Just Walking into the airport, you know, I just felt something physical happening. So, but that is not to say that um, this space doesn't do anything for me too. It, it, it does. I mean, I've been here all this time. Some of my family is here. So I, I, I am now negotiating to spaces that actually mean, uh, mean a lot. And of course, I always remember that I was able to do my MFA and write here. Um, you know, when I went home, I was support, I mean, when I was at home, I was working toward being a lawyer. So when I came here, because there, were, there was no adult supervision in that <laughs> sense, I was able to do what I wanted to do. So they are, they are always given takes to every situation. I think we have time for two, two more questions. Is that correct? Yeah, People who run the, the space? Okay. So one on that end. Well, thank you very much for your contribution and congratulations. Thank you. And um, what I wanted to ask you was when you were putting the book, well, I agree with you about the English language because my family are West Indian, mm -hmm. but we grew up in England, so I understand the, the, the barriers that were created in the English language. But my question to you was when you were writing your book, did you have an idea of where you were going or did the book lead you to where you got to? Um, at first I thought I had an idea, and then the book quickly showed me that I wasn't necessarily in charge. And I think that's part of the creative uh, process. At some point, the thing start to get a life of its own, and I think you simply learn to step back and allow it uh, to be. And I find that as a creator, that's when I am close to my best. When, the, when I let the thing uh, breathe. But it was, you know, once I got comfortable, once I let it happen, it was, it was just great writing it. I, I enjoyed the process. Okay, back over to the far left, and this will be the final question. Thanks so much uh, for allowing me to ask the final question. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I, I have a question related to both the writing process, but then also the reflecting process when you're now hearing people talk about the book. As, as the writer, I think it's very interesting that you said that you see yourself as being at the center. Um, but at the same time, are you aware of the different types of audience that will be reading it? I'm assuming it being very different if somebody back home reads the book versus someone here in the US, for example. Are you aware of the audience's different perceptions? And does that inform how you feel you need to explain certain scenarios? And then on the receiving end, now that you're hearing people's perspective on it, mm -hmm. um, is there an, anima an element of universal perception of the experience? Or do you see also fundamental differences in the way people experience the book? So someone, let's say, a Western person versus an African person, and how is it perceived back home in Zimbabwe? What, what have been the reactions? And how does that all differ in the way you see it? Um, I, I think I like to imagine my audience as anybody who, who is aware that as long as they are reading a human story, 
uh, it is also theirs in a way they are connected to it. But interestingly, when I, when I reflect, when I choose to write in what a, a friend of mine, uh, who's also a writer, calls English written in Debele, which is my language, I wonder if subconsciously I'm thinking of a Debele reader. I don't think I am when I'm writing, but looking at, at, at people's responses, I mean, those uh, Debele speakers we have gotten back feel like I wrote the book for them, you know? And they'll be like, yeah, thank you. It's just amazing how you wrote the way we speak. And then I ended up thinking, I end up thinking, hmm, maybe I was thinking of those specific readers. But at the same time, I am also taking care of other readers who are not necessarily of, of, of that culture. And especially as somebody who lives outside, you just realize that you're, you are just connected, you know. And as a reader myself, growing up reading all sorts of things from outside, um, I use my hands a lot, sorry. <laughs> um, but I think they're trying to help the language. Um, but I, I think I'm also, I'm also thinking of, of all those readers and trying to create some democratic country where anybody can pick and read and understand. In terms of people's um, reactions to the book, well, that's when I, I again get to realize that I'm not in charge because people will come and with their interpretations and responses, and it's amazing. But what I've always found interesting is that sometimes people find things that I didn't even plan on. Um, sometimes they make me sound smarter than I am, but I'm, <laughs> I wrote the thing, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, happy, um, it's, a, it's a happy accident. But it's, it's, it's my first book, and it's, it's been quite fascinating to hear back, you know. And um, I am lucky sometimes to get emails from people from all over, and I, I get the sense that people connect to the story um, just because of who the characters are and what the story is. All right, so again, oh, go ahead, clap. <laughs> and I just wanted to thank uh, all of you for coming. I wanted to thank sponsors. I want to thank. No Violet for writing this book and for reading part of it today. And then you have one more job to do, which is you have to go to that little fish tank area back there and, and sign books for people. So go buy the book if you don't have it. And then once you buy it, read it. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>